Jessica. I'm very happy to welcome you here with us today. And um, also, it's very nice to hear what you have to tell us, especially now that your subject uh, is so much up to date with what is happening uh, around uh, the states and around the world um, uh, in relation to racism and um, violation um, of rights, uh, which you also mentioned uh, at your uh, talk to us. So I'm very uh, pleased to hear you and um, I'm uh, um, I'm just going to introduce the White City Center uh, briefly. So mm -hmm. the Liebling House is a, a center for architecture, urbanism and conservation. Mm -hmm. We are a prolonged arm of the engineering department of the municipality of Tel Aviv Jaffa. And our aim is to research and to also bring public debate in topics of urbanism and architecture um, to the city. Um, and we are also partnering uh, with the German government, with the uh, German building ministry, which is supporting us. This is why this talk today um, with you as a German is also uh, super interesting for us. So um, uh, I would like to also welcome the people who are listening to our center, the Liebling House, which is opened already after the Corona uh, from uh, two weeks ago. We're having uh, lots of um, exhibitions and seminars and workshops and tours. So please um, join us at the Liebling House, Edelson 29, and stay tuned to the next um, lectures that we have from uh, this um, department of research. So please, Martin, it's uh, your stage. Uh, thank you very much, Sharon. Um, I have to see how I get into my lecture now. Can you see the first slide? Can I get a feedback if you can see the first slide? Or no, we can't. Okay, let me see. Maybe I have to um, do some screen sharing again. Yes, now we can. Okay, perfect. Just, Just do it. Uh, slideshow on PowerPoint, great. Okay. No, but we see your marks from the right side, so. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah. Let me see. You might have to. One second. Is this better? Yes, that's super. Okay. So, um, uh, I'm going to give a talk about the influence that the Bauhaus had on Chicago and maybe also in a wider sense on the United States. And as Sharon already mentioned, the subjects that are an outcome of the development uh, of the influences from the Bauhaus on Chicago are really much, very much coming uh, into presence right now again. What you see here, the poster is a collage of a Hilbersheimer um, sketch of one of his um, urbanist perspectives that had been a utopia. And I will refer to it later on in more detail. Then the city in the background as it has grown today and a poster in the back that is a poster relating to a movie by Spike Lee called Chirac that is focusing on the violence in Chirac and draws a comparison between Iraq and Chirac, uh, Chicago. So as so many stories around the world, the influence of the Bauhaus starts really with the closure of the Bauhaus by the Nazis in Germany. And with that, the fleeing of many of the Bauhaus participants, scholars, and teachers all over the world. Here you see an image of Lionel Feiniger, or by Lionel Feiniger, when the Bauhaus, he and his group and friends arrived in New York City in 1936. Many of the Bauhaus teachers first went to London, tried to find new grounds there, but uh, couldn't get established. And finally, 
were contracted in, in the United States and pretty much had their influence uh, as a school of international style uh, there. When Mies came to Chicago, Mies van der Rohe, along with Ludwig Hilbersheimer, Peter Hans, and others, Laszlo No uh, he found the city built out of stone. Uh, he found a city that was pretty much an industrial city. And as you see it here, this is an image, a panoramic image of Chicago around 1935. And <clears throat> it was a time when Chicago had developed more or less for a hundred years from a city of less than a million to a city of about six million by the 1930s. So the city was trying to find a change. What you see below is the so-called gray city, the industrial Chicago. And the city tried to reinvent itself over and over again through international building exhibitions, as you see it on the top, the so-called White City, the World's Columbian Exposition from 1893, and Burnham's plan of a very uh, bizarre idea of urban development, uh, probably his most successful and most famous development tweak was the invention of the grid. But this is much more. This is really an urban development that was focusing on a modernist idea of urban establishment with a layout that is divided up into different urban functions, as them were later articulated by the Athens Charter in 1933. We see the, the difference between green water and uh, some corridors that um, penetrate through the grid. And there was already the, an idea of a city of creating different functional zones that. Uh, were um, organizing the city very much in the modernist idea of analyzing the complexity of a city's life, of a metropolis, uh, cutting it down into its elements and resetting it into a plan. What else they found is an industrial city that was completely mechanized, a city that worked almost as a machine. Here we can see the rivers crossing, the, the, the bridge is crossing the Chicago River in 1941. And each of those bridges work as a machine that can open and close whenever a boat comes through. The city was pretty much impacted by its steel manufacturing. Iron ore was shipped to Chicago and manufactured into steel. Right, right around that time, the steel industry was very much involved into producing battleships for the Second World War. Aside from the meat industry, of course, that Chicago is also so famous for, but that is less influential on the architects that came from the Bauhaus to Chicago. Here you can see the southern rail yards around 1917 that reached from the south to the Chicago River and create a transitioning point between the ships and the goods shipped by boat as well as by train. This was almost a, a field of steel that uh, took about a quarter of downtown Chicago. Chicago had been the largest train hub in the Midwest, and by that time also the world largest train hub, because the lines were going from the East Coast to Chicago, and then from there, the entire West of the United States was found through trailways that were built from Chicago all the way down to California and to New Mexico. So with this 
material steel found in Chicago, there was an opportunity given for those architects to kind of reinvent their utopias that they had to, that they had dreamt up in in Germany during the Weimar Republic. And soon enough, the first plans were started of a new city where the realization of the Athens Charter was supposed to take place right around the area where you find IIT. You can see the IIT campus, the Illinois Institute of Technology that Mies had become director for. So that Mies and Hilversheimer started to uh, plan on the entire area. Mies had really re uh, received um, the commission to develop a campus by the Armour Institute of Technology, the predecessor of the Illinois Institute of Technology. And you can see the very first scheme that he had come up in the early 40s, where this is still, when if you see around this axis, you can see that this is a symmetrical plan of a campus. What the board of overseers really wanted me to design was a traditional university plan that were more in the fashion of a Victorian plan or a neoclassicistic or neo-Gothic plan. So a plan that has squadrons along an axis and would be symmetrical. So Mies designed the first layout of his plan symmetrically, but slightly manipulated the condition of the plan into a more asymmetric condition, as we will see later. What, as you can see, is an open plan of the entire area here. So this three square mile development area is an open urban plan that was very untypical for Chicago at that time and was right along with the ideas of Hilversheimer who had come up with this proposal for the Berlin Gendarmark where he basically proposed to erase the historically grown city and replace it with these super blocks. Very minimalist, very radical approach on urban development at that time, but very much what Dan Mies and Hilversheimer started to set in reality by the development of the campus. Here you can see the next development steps, still the axis around 32nd Street as a symmetry axis, but the symmetry starts to fall apart in these areas already. So. This is not as it has been built, but this was one of the first proposals uh, in 1940 by Mies to the Board of Overseers of the Armour Institute of Technology. Hand in hand, the city was looking into these visions of urban development and implanting more uh, of those developments uh, pretty much all around the city. Uh, this was a plan of converting the city from the gray city that it had been, from an industrial city with, of low quality, of low living quality, into a futurist idea uh, of high living quality with air, hygienic conditions, affordable housing, green, and uh, areas to play and also regeneration re and to retire pr pretty much around those uh, buildings that were supposed to be uh, planned. So it was the modernist um, approach on really a social, social agenda uh, that was already formulated 20 years earlier by Walter Gropius, by Hannes Meyer. Now supposed to be realized in the US. And we can see that it went into two directions. Here, a poster, a flyer that was sent out by the city in 1954, kind of advertising 
the surgery of the city, the redevelopment. You can still see the southern train yards in this area that is now a large inner urban park, so-called Grand Park. So you can pretty much see that this quarter is all train yards and it's almost a quarter of entire downtown. Soon enough, the campus was in production and it was crowned by Crown Hall. That is not called Crown Hall because it was crowning the campus. Uh, it, was, it is called Crown Hall because the Crown family had given the money, the funds for building this building. It was a revolution in so far as it had largest pieces of glass ever seen on a building and it was a wide span building. So Mies um, used steel that he found in Chicago and started to push the use of steel in construction as it had never been seen before. Here you can see the open plan in Crown Hall. Um, it's a building that appears to us so normal and this type of facade system, the curtain wall facade system, appears to us as something that we see all over the world by now. But really, this was the foundation stone. This was the experiment where the first large space horizontal span had been developed as an architectural school. If somebody has uh, the microphone on, please uh, tune mute. Please turn it on mute. Okay, thanks. Uh, what we see here is the Bauhaus curriculum, the, the diagram that visualized the Bauhaus curriculum from 1922 as it was set in place by Walter Gropius uh, for the Bauhaus uh, that uh, was then taught this way in Dessau. Here we see the semester plan. And <clears throat> we can see that next to architecture, there was also graphic design, reclame kind of um, advertisement, uh, stage work, stage design, but also theater. And then also the arts as for sculpture, painting, and so on. The plan in Chicago for the school in Chicago was becoming an almost purely architectural curriculum. We can still see that there are the material focuses in place, in this case, wood, stone, brick, steel, and concrete that we see in the early plan around here, where there also had been a focus on material. But in this case, it is more construction uh, materials and it's not any more decorative materials. And this plan pretty much shows us, sorry, this shouldn't have. This plan pretty much shows us that we have um, a focus uh, on architecture and maybe urban planning that was taught by Mies van der Rohe and Hilbesheimer. Parallel to this, there was Laszlo Noli Naji, who was teaching graphic design and experimental photography. Eventually, both were still located in Crown Hall, the Institute of Design that was found by Laszlo was located in the basement of Crown Hall and the architecture school was located upstairs in the Grand Hall. But eventually there was a rival going on. Laszlo had the uh, idea that Crown Hall and the Institute of Technology was supposed to be something like the new Bauhaus in the new lands of America. But Mies uh, was in contradiction to this idea and uh, which eventually came also to um, splits upon the idea of design uh, where Laszlo was proposing much more graphical design ideas and Mies idea of design was much more going towards architecture and 
uh, engineering and realization of built buildings. So the Institute of Design moved out in the late 50s, early 60s, out of Crown Hall. And me started to go after his architectural ideas. So we have first um, the idea of graphic design, then we have the idea of architecture, and we have the idea of urban design. So three different ideas of design that this uh, branch of Bauhaus um, development was about. We can see on the left side the Friedrichstraßen Tower uh, that was a design proposal by Mies for a competition that uh, created great laughter and uh, ridiculed Mies because nobody had ever seen a tower made out of glass and it was not thinkable that this would ever be done. But soon enough, it was up to me to eventually go forward and build his Lakeshaw uh, apartments that you can see on the right side, which were the buildings made out of steel and glass with glass surface that the world had never seen before. Again, these were the prototypes, these were the experimental realizations of typologies that seemed to be normal to us today, but this was revolutionary back in the days when this was built. His architecture inspired a great, a great group of architects in Chicago. Among those were the a group of SOM architects of Skidmore Owen and Amaro, who immediately looked at the idea of industrial building and industrial design and applying the industry into the process of construction and saw that this would be something that is not only great for making a new type of architecture, but also for making money. Because you can pretty much mass produce buildings, you can produce buildings for masses of people, and one can standardize processes of designing and of construction so that one almost works like an assembly belt in an architecture office. So you can see the Inland Steel building by the Inland Steel Company that is the headquarter of one of those steel plants that was producing steel in and around Chicago. And this was a revolution because this was the first build, uh, building made out of stainless steel with a stainless steel cladding facade that the world until then had only known in small utensils that were usually used in hospitals or so. But to see an entire building made out of stainless steel was unknown. And this was pretty much advertisement for the Inland Steel Company who built a building out of material that they de produced in their own factories and in their own plants. So you can see the open office idea again that is pretty much the Crown Hall uh, transformance of the Crown Hall stacked into multiple stories. So we have the same idea of the exterior um, framework and the exterior structure as Crown Hall has, but in this case, a stacked condition. So it's a stacked Crown Hall if one wants so. And one sees and now that uh, SOM took what was originated by Mies van der Rohe and pretty much uh, put it onto a level of mass, mass uh, construction. Also, the John Hancock building designed by one of the students at IIT that eventually was taken over by SOM and uh, turned into a buildable um, proposal. Um, that is an outcome of the school at IIT and, of course, of Mies experimental engineering as well as one of the students at IIT, Bertrand Goldberg, 
marina tower that he built here at the Chicago River that were not only revolutionary in form and in the application of structural concrete, but also that it was one of the first buildings that started to make use of the water other than it being for uh, wastewater and uh, for traffic. In this case, there's uh, a harbor built on the water level and there are malls built into the buildings as well as a lower portion of garage, garages for parking their cars. So this was really one of the, the architects that started to take what he learned at IIT and push his ideas further and further, coming up with new shapes and new forms of living, also with combinations of new programming, uh, pretty much the first, if we want so, hybrid programmed buildings. Here we see Mies National Gallery in Berlin. That was his last building built and also his first building uh, built after the war that influenced pretty much McCormick Place in Chicago that is in scale much larger, a convention center by Murphy and Associates. Gene Summers was the designer who was also one of me's students at IIT. So we can see the similarity of the structure again, the cross-shaped columns that one knows at the National Gallery, but in this case combined with the space frame that is carried by the center colors, co columns. This building is sitting right at the lake. Parallel, we have developments in Chicago where uh, the ideas of Hilversheimer started to uh, became, become more and more realized and influencing to the city of Chicago. You can see on the left side the areas where the most amount of African American people started um, settling in Chicago, which is mainly on the south side and also on the West Loop area here. So here's Chicago Loop, the Chicago Loop in this area. And just right south of this, we have the south side of Chicago with a very black mark for Bronzeville, which is also called the Black Metropolis, which was a flourishing neighborhood of African American businesses and um, uh, businesses, school, church, culture, one can say music, there was a big jazz scene in this area, jazz and blues scene. And um, eventually the city started to uh, focus on this area to realize their urban new renewal projects that also started to influence pretty much a fall down of the black metropolis, which was kind of a city within the city uh, due to segregation and also racism that was still in place back then. So here we can see a close-up image of what was called the gray city of kind of the slum conditions of the grown Chicago. And then the idea of Ludwig Hilbersheimer of a high-rise city combined to with highways, with urban infrastructures, multi-leveled, which then was supposed to become reality in Chicago. What we see here is the so-called Stateway Gardens and the Robert Taylor Homes. They used to be um, south of the Illinois campus. So this is the southernmost building of the Illinois Institute of Technology. Um, it is a, a power plant owned by IIT. And then we see the development that uh, was influenced by the urban design ideas of Hilversheimer combined with the highway. And here we can see the images of before and after. So we again have the idea of the tabula rasa where you wipe out entire areas of the city, this, this area here, and uh, eventually replace it with the same type of mass building and mass construction. 
So it's an affordable way of uh, going forward, building houses and trying to house uh, masses amounts of people and also making money because it was able to produce these buildings in an industrial way. Again, here on the left side, Chicago had, it has, had grown in the area around IIT and here the same area after the wipeout and the start of the construction of the new buildings in the back. So the principle again, we have a life cycle of Chicago habitat projects or habitat um, facilities where multiple blocks get wiped out and replaced by super blocks that um, use about 20% of uh, the site's area and eventually uh, they don't work for uh, reasons that I will explain now and uh, will be destroyed again. So here we can see the destruction of the grown city in Chicago and the forthcoming of the projects, the so-called projects as they are called in the United States so it's large housing for lower classes, for low income classes that cannot afford uh, better housing and eventually find themselves in these areas. What we can see here also is a church that is a remnant. Um, I think it's the, it's the Roberts Temple that is playing a role in the cultural revolution and the civil rights movement that I will also refer to in a little bit. So what, what we have here is a typology of building that we also know in Europe um, and in many parts of the other, of, uh, in, in, in other parts of the world, but uh, the same typology also exists on other sides of Chicago and had been very successful. But in this case, it had not been successful because we found out they were just not equipped with the supplies that one needs in order to have a good living. There were no kindergartens, there were no grocery stores. There was, um, these people could not afford uh, cars, so they could not drive to other places in order to buy food. There was no green. It was just purely housing set onto uh, erased urban areas. Here's an overview plan that shows pretty much all the so-called low-income projects developed all over the Chicago area. And here again in Exxon. So one can see these are uh, large developments that definitely had their, their influence. In this axon, we can also see that the, all these developments are always next to uh, industrial corridors that are combined with highways, waterways, but also with emissions, of course. And uh, so these ideas of urban renewal were not really ideas of high quality cities because they were placed in areas where they were um, influenced by emissions and of course by also noise impact uh, and so on. So eventually uh, the mass housing and the mass poverty in these areas uh, took its turn when a Chicagoan was lynched somewhere in the south of the United States his, the name is Emmett Till, who had traveled, I believe, to Mississippi and was lynched by uh, people in Mississippi. And eventually his body was brought back to Chicago. And when the funeral took place, um, the newspaper showed his body and the people came together and started to protest that this is not any more acceptable as today. It's a condition that is very similar to um, what happened today, two weeks ago. So Emmett Till's death 
and the publication of his dead body brought thousands and ten thousands of African American to the funeral at the Roberts Temple, which is just one block south of IIT. And they started their march from there, which then turned into the civil rights movement around Martin Luther King and the Black Panthers. And had a turn on IIT uh, and on had a turn on Chicago because um, the, the protests were also combined with riots, and, which led to people just moving out of the city into the suburbs, which is a movement called the White Flight. And eventually the city collapsed uh, that, so that downtown Chicago was a dangerous place and almost the same development took place as it uh, happened to Detroit, where the city became an inverted city. And Chicago made its way around, but the development was very similar. This was pretty much marked by Stanley Tigerman's Titanic, a collage of crown halls sinking into Lake Michigan in comparison to the motion pictures image, the Titanic, which boat body was also um, cantilevering out of the water when it was sinking after hitting an iceberg. So uh, what this uh, image signified is this is the end of modernism. This is the end of a doctrine um, because the modernist idea, the Bauhaus idea of mechanization, um, of mass provision for affordable uh, housing, turned into an idea of living and into an environment that was not seen and regarded anymore as high quality. This had to do with two things that uh, on the one hand, uh, people were getting more prosperous and the idea of minimal standards such as hygienic conditions, affordable housing, fresh air, and uh, a functional environment was not enough anymore. There was more desired, more demand, plus that the idea and the mass producing had been forced so much that it almost became a doctrine of mass production of architecture and urban planning with environments that were not anymore focusing on the human being, but much more on resolving political, um, political agendas and, of course, making money. So we come to the second part of the lecture, uh, and I have to talk about Chicago a little bit more. We see here the city. Um, center that makes about 0.03% of the metropolis, metropolis area. Uh, we see the grid and then we see these um, kind of free areas, which are the industrial corridors cutting through the city. Here again, we see the high rise city, uh, the loop, and then the city center, Grand Park, now as a park, this, the condition today. And this is just 0.03 of the entire area of the metropolis. And we see the North Branch and the South Branch of the Chicago River surrounded by urban corridors. I'm going to um, go through a variety of different approaches that are dependencies and influences that are pretty much connected to urban planning as it had been found by Ludwig Hilversheimer and others and the minim min minimalist city. Here you see an overlay of all urban barriers that cut this grid of the city into patches and create pretty much islands between these. Um, these barriers consist of urban waters. We have the large body of water of the Michigan Lake and then we have the rivers cutting through the grid. Here you can see the Chicago River coming in. Here's Mies um, IBM building, and then next to it uh, are the 
Goldberg Towers. And here we see the South Branch of the Chicago River floating out of downtown Chicago, surrounded by the patch of large industrial urban uh, industrial corridors that partially also have been already converted into parks. We see the Lakeshore Drive along um, downtown, which is considered my, one of the best rides in the world, um, especially for a car city like Chicago, but is pretty much um, conditioned by the verticality of the city and the horizontality of the lake that one can almost experience nowhere in the, in the world like that. With the rail, railways coming into the city that create certain boundaries, but create a public transportation network that is not um, generated tight enough in order to facilitate everybody so that the city came up with a rapid transit system, bus system that creates a, that uses, um, takes advantage of the grid in order to facilitate um, fast bus driving in the city combined with the regional Amtrak trains. We have the highways cutting through the city. Here we have IIT's campus in this area. Next to it, the highway, here the development area that um, I was talking about earlier. Um, this is already a, a shot that was taken after all the projects had been torn down. And uh, we can see new ideas of development um, growing in this area. These highways were designed and built in the 1950s after the wars by traffic planners that saw the individual car, the individual vehicular traffic as the only way of um, pursuing moving in the city and pretty much knocked out large part portions of the city and divided up uh, areas of, of the city and also destroyed the grid if you want so. We have the industrial corridors around the river and also around train tracks as well as highway lanes. You can see these urban corridors that cut through the grid. This is the Chicago grid. And then we see the penetration of the urban corridors here also another highway. So this all has an impact and influences the conditions as we know them in Chicago today. We can see here different colors, different colored patches, and they are all defined by these urban barriers. They are all holding the grid with them themselves. And if one looks closely, one can see that there is a history of different languages of people that came from overseas to Chicago and with them different ethnic different distributions that are pretty much connected to the color patches. For example, here we see these different patches and we see the different white areas. The different white areas are areas where we have either industrial corridors or other barriers. So we have uh, a relationship or comparable condition between the patches and the distribution of different groups living in the city. Now, in 2017, uh, the homicide rate was at its peak in Chicago, and uh, we had uh, deaths uh, about every 13 hours per day and people that got shot by a handgun almost every three hours so that we could see that there were different zones of violence and criminal activities in the city. You see a map of no-go zones. Deep red are the zones where it was really dangerous to go and then uh, the lighter the color get, gets, um, the more friendly uh, the environments would be. So you can see that there is um, a concentration in the near west and on the south side. 
And here you see the comparison between income in the past, uh, today, and the homicides. And you can also see the low income, which are the dark orange areas, pretty much coexist and correlate to the highest areas, uh, the areas of highest homicides. You can see gang activities, police and fire departments, as well as ethnic distribution, language distribution. And if we overlay these, if we over, for example, overlay income with gang activity, we can see that the gangs are concentrated in the area of the lowest income. We can also see that the lowest income is concentrated around the areas of, um, of these urban, of these industrial corridors. And we can also see that the ethnic distribution is pretty much coinciding with the patches between the urban corridors. So we can more and more identify an isolated condition that is generated by an urban layout. You can see the uh, comparison between homicide rates, murder rates in the city, and uh, gang activities uh, also, um, especially in this area, coinciding very much. Governance. <clears throat> if we look at Chicago, we can still see the idea of Burnham, the idea of a distribution of different functions of the city. It's not a homogeneous distribution, it's a distribution into different areas. So different areas are, different, are differently assigned to uh, particular functions. This is also the idea of the Athens, Athen Charter. So here, if we zoom in, we see these patches, we see that we have industrial corridors that are yellow, we have um, dual commercial um, use, uh, we have uh, residential use that is green, that are also in patches here. And the question is, why does this have to be patches? Why can this not be pixels? If we now take pixels as an idea, as an image of how urban planning and urban programming could be, this would mean it's minimal units of urban functions that are working spread out, decentralized, and homogeneously distributed all over the city. What if we have uh, this, this idea of mixing all urban functions and putting them into areas of uh, urban corridors and the urban barriers? This proposal was designed because the, the question is, if we can, how can we overcome barriers? And we can overcome barriers if we make them what the city is missing, which is the diversity and the zones where the different patches mix, where the different ethnic groups and different social classes would be able to mix and come together. So we have to kind of uh, move on from an idea that of a city that was designed for heavy industry and for heavy immigration towards an idea of a city that is designed, that is a metropolis, that is large, and that has multiple different, uh, multiple groups of culture and ethnic groups. So this could be something that happens on the first floor so that the civic space, the public space would be influenced by the idea of um, of pixelation. Here we see an urban corridor pick, pixelized and eventually creating what we call the urban blue between the different patches of the city. There could be incubations and architectures that consist of pixelation entirely, that is mixed use architecture. And maybe it could also be that one um, covers highways as it has been done uh, recently in Hamburg and created large amount of areas that 
uh, now available as parks to the public. Here we see an area that is, uh, had been once an industrial corridor. The industry is gone and here a scenario of how this could be. So take on vast, wasted land and convert it where the potentials are into agricultural land as well as different ideas of living and working, producing and uh, governing. Economic dependencies are also related uh, to this idea. So we have Chicago as a city that is a centralized city at the lake. So we have again, the city center that offers most amount of work and everybody's commuting into uh, the city center. And on the other hand, the city center is even cut off by the lake. So we have a very strong extreme condition in the 1960s when all the urban development happened in and around the, uh, around the heavy industrial corridors. Uh, this was working, but eventually in 1914, when the heavy industry had been uh, gone down, uh, the only area that provided, provided work was 5% of the city area, which is 0.03 of the metropolitan area, is offering 40% uh, of work. So it's a very centralized idea. And uh, if we now say or ask what happens if those industries that uh, now offer 40% of work, which are uh, white collar industry, that is service industry, insurance and finance in industry, if they would go down, uh, the city would be heavily affected. And again, the question is, what if we rethink this? If we start to diversize, uh, create a diversity of all economic functions in the city and pixelate that, what happened a heavy industrial field to produce a small item, a hammer or uh, uh, even a gun, uh, is now a printer that has shoebox format and one can produce these items in, in one home, uh, at home, and uh, in a minimalized uh, way of manufacturing. So. We, we have examples of industrialization and manufacturing that are not comparable anymore. We have a different scale today that allows us to rethink city and rethink the multiplicity of urban functions. Arterial centers and places. A, norm, a normal city has one center and grows around it. And I was talking about how Chicago had been cut off. So we have the, the condition that we have the center and then we have the spread and almost no sub-centers. But the question would be, uh, could we fill the entire uh, baseland of post-industrial uh, production areas with housing, with a new type of city, so that we don't have the idea of patches anymore as it was proposed by Hilversheimer in the past and had been experimental fields. But maybe it's a city of density. It's a city that we have here, which is the city center, becomes decentralized by the same density branching out through the entire urban fabric of the metropolis. <clears throat> so here we can see the potential that is available through the urban corridors that are potentially right now uh, creating problems, creating segregation, creating uh, uh, differences between different cultures in the city, and, uh, but also the potential of them being centers, of them owning work, offering work, becoming central functions for the, for the metropolitan area. If we look at Chicago, there are very little Subcenters. Here you can see some strips and some neighborhoods where there are subcenters that are well functioning. For example, Bucktown and Wicker Park 
or Chinatown is one of those sub-centers. Uh, we have uh, Boys Town, which is the uh, gender, free gender um, movement area that also works pretty much 24 seven. But if we look at an idea of sub-center and we start to project that onto Chicago, we can draw a comparison, for example, to New York or Manhattan, which is also a gridded city. And almost the entire land of Manhattan is working 24 seven, is a sub-center, is central. And the question is, what if we project onto Chicago? What if there's Chicago in areas where it is activated much more so that there is more activity in public and with that, there's more control on the streets and also more mixture among the people, which might be an idealized view on the city, but probably a proposal that could lead to a better uh, urban condition. So here we have an alley in Chicago, which is more or less a supply and a fire um, emergency uh, way. And we have an alley in Napoli uh, that is the same scale, uh, which is full of life and uh, working very well. But Napoli is a porous city that works very well on the first scale. And one can go through the buildings where the, the city in Chicago has alleys that are pretty much cut off and don't allow for any porosity. You Martin, can, see, can you please uh, start finishing? We have uh, yeah. usually 45 minutes, so we're past our time, but I would like to... Okay, uh, I wind down. Make people some t ...leave people some time to ask questions. So if you okay. can okay, sum I up, thank you. Okay, I will. Um, yeah, so at the end, I, I, uh, the, the last uh, chapter is basically what kind of architecture can heal a city and can overcome these questions. Um, Bauhaus provided us with, uh, with a catalog and a way, a culture of thought that pretty much can uh, still alive. And here we see architecture that articulates means of organity and urbanity that are brought from the street into the architecture, where architecture is street as well as urban life. Uh, this is the example from Toronto, the Sonietta Student Learning Center by at Ryerson University. The idea, idea of um, concentrating program, that it mixes up and becomes much more interactive and used around the clock versus different program programmatic components and urban components are active at different times of the city. The idea of winding the urban scale into architecture and connecting architecture to its infrastructure as well as uh, making it interactive to its cultural and um, pretty much um, civic environment. And maybe the idea of further utopias that we think a uh, city completely different, that we may have to think a city, a vertical city, and uh, stack a city so that the living happens in the stack and uh, the untouched land is still remained, stay untouched. And we have new means of new transportation away from the car and we have maybe ideas of bringing air, hygienic conditions, manufacturing affordable housing, as well as welfare and residential life, again, into an idea of urban life. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, um, Martin. That was a very interesting lecture and we learned a lot about Chicago. Um, it's interesting how modernism got its way to Tel Aviv, to Israel, but uh, also, of course, made its way to Chicago and found a completely different grounds on which a completely different city developed. So in this way, it's even more interesting to compare Tel Aviv and Chicago and its modernistic uh, le legacy. Yes. Um, mm. But I would ask you maybe to uh, refer to also the COVID-19 episode 
uh, epitome uh, and maybe also talk about your ideas of uh, urban planning. Um, I mean, in Chicago also, uh, you know, they learned from modernism after um, World War I uh, and after, you know, the uh, Industrial Revolution, of course, the ideas were to separate between living and working and to create places of hygiene and air and light, as you said. But um, now uh, we are viewing a completely different moment in time where these separations on one hand do not fit a city anymore, but on the other hand, maybe COVID-19 is also telling us, okay, we still need to, you know, uh, stay um, somehow uh, be able to, uh, to find our own spaces within the city. So how does it, this, all, all this refer to what you've just told us and your thoughts about the development of Chicago in the future? Yeah, the, that's, a, that's a good um, question. Really, uh, one can probably take the idea of pixelization and the idea of decentralization also as an idea that might uh, protect us as well as in situations as we have them right now. Of course, uh, it's, we can also see now uh, during COVID-19 where many people work from home and stay at home for a long time that uh, it becomes a big problem. It's a psychological uh, condition that we are not made for. And uh, I think that we need to focus uh, what the situation shows us that we are not made to be um, alone. We are made to uh, work together, be together. Uh, we are made to interact as human beings. And uh, so urbanism and maybe also thinking architecture, I think uh, must probably focus much more on uh, creating an infrastructure and logistics for people to interact and uh, meet of course, in times as we have them right now during COVID, uh, we need to be able to withdraw and have this opportunity to kind of um, create our home offices and be in isolation and be within groups that are highly controlled and so on. But I think what we learned from that is uh, also that there is a, there's a, a large need for people to interact. And um, we probably are just at the verge of getting insight on what it means to have the entire world withdrawn into their homes, working from home for weeks and weeks, if not months and months. I mean, the situation right now in the States is so, so vast that uh, people stay in the houses much longer than I experience this right now in Germany and probably Israel is also much better off than the people are right now in the States. Yes, perhaps even this violation or uh, how you say it, like uh, the uh, interference of human rights and this rage um, of racism also has to do something um, with the fact that we could not interact and could not mm -hmm. meet each other and could not uh, you know, socialize in a way. Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. might be also in some ways connected. It would be interesting to perhaps research that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, and the protests right now in the States, uh, it, it seems to be that they are more uh, ethnic, of ethnic nature or race uh, protests against racism. They are against racism, but they are going much, much, much further. Um, they are also hitting on global, um, global entities, on um, corporate environments. In Chicago, Michigan Avenue, the street that is uh, represented by global entities, had been heavily destructed, as well as uh, other streets. And what one can see is that there is uh, there is a, a general uh, 
uh, need, demand for social stability uh, that uh, is probably not given anymore in an environment uh, such as the United States, where some uh, global entities still make money, a lot of money, uh, during this time, whereas other industries fall apart. For example, the, well, the, the health system doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Because it became a system that was made, was converted to make money. It used to be a governmentally driven system that was privatized and now it was uh, transformed into an industry to make money and out of a sudden it doesn't work as a mass covering system. And I think that is what we can learn from uh, the intention of the early modernists who really had social ideas, who had really yes. an idea of trying to give access of social stability to the broad population. We have this in the energy factor, uh, sector. Uh, it's an industry where you cannot make money. We have that in public transportation. You cannot make money in public transportation if you want to make it accessible to everybody. So either we work these industries as a community and we pay taxes or somehow we uh, in, invest into them. And so it becomes what we call welfare or common fare. So it's accessible for everybody and creates equality for everybody. Or we withdraw it from the public sector and we make it accessible as a money-making entity and all of a sudden it creates problems. And this is really uh, the outcry that happens in the States right now. People are on the street because they are fed up that, uh, that quality is taken away from them and now they suffer. They cannot pay their rent anymore because they lost their jobs, because they don't have any security and stability. Yes, I find it very, very interesting. But I must say that um, it's not only in the state. I feel that, you know, you being also a German, also in Germany, we see that yeah. in the public space, rage comes uh, up and uh, people start to demonstrate and uh, people start to come together from all different reasons. But there's a lot of voices of anger mm. that you can see in public spaces. Um, and I wonder if, um, you know, public spaces uh, are, of course, a, a space where you should be able to uh, express yourself. So I think uh, perhaps we as architects should really learn from those um, corridors, as you said, or those empty spaces, those voids where nothing is in order to crystallize the situation of the society today. Mm. Um, Okay, do we have any more questions from the audience? Uh, the one second. Okay, um, there's no more questions. Um, thank you very much, Martin, for this thank wonderful for lecture mm -hmm. and this insight to Chicago and to Germany and uh, to modernism. Uh, that was very, very nice. I hope we can uh, one day collaborate and do something together. Mm -hmm. Uh, and for all the rest of our listeners, next week we have uh, city engineer Udi Carmeli, which is a great honor for us as well. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, city planning of Tel Aviv uh, during the COVID-19 times and what uh, he learned from it and what he sees for Tel Aviv in the future. So it's a great place to also create an active talk, an active urban talk about uh, Tel Aviv um, and about the times, the special times we're living in right now. So thank you again, Martin, and I hope to see you soon. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye.